I don't like the idea that we're so close to this big thing. It's like a bomb. Fukushima and Chernobyl. Look at the disasters that occurred there. Wait a minute. Are you saying then if the coalition gets into government and goes ahead with their nuclear plan, that people are going to die from cancer, heart attacks and strokes? Is nuclear energy safe? You've probably heard the claim that nuclear plants produce tons and tons of toxic waste that lasts for a very long time. Anti-nuclear advocates often cite Chernobyl, Fukushima and Three Mile Island as reasons why nuclear plants are too dangerous to build. But the truth is, nuclear is one of the safest energy sources. Even taking into account deaths from accidents, nuclear energy is remarkably safe. This is because the modern nuclear industry is strictly regulated to prevent accidents from happening. But haven't accidents at nuclear plants caused thousands of deaths throughout history? Not quite. Take Chernobyl, the worst nuclear accident in history. Of the 600 workers present at the disaster, 134 suffered from radiation sickness, with 30 dying from the blast and radiation exposure. Of the next two decades, 19 more workers died, but not all of these deaths can be linked to radiation. As for the local community, the only clear increase in cancer risk was for thyroid cancer, which has a very high survival rate. It is difficult to attribute a certain number of cancer deaths to Chernobyl because any increase is lost in the many thousands of cancers resulting from other causes. What about Fukushima? While the tsunami and earthquake themselves caused almost 20,000 deaths, the nuclear accident only caused one death seven years later. The worker who died had been responsible for measuring radiation at the plant following the accident. There were no deaths in the local community because the containment structure functioned as designed protecting residents from dangerous levels of radiation. While each of these deaths is a tragedy, it's important to put these numbers in perspective. In Russia in 2023, a single petrol station explosion injured 115 people and killed 35. In South Korea last year, a massive factory fire started by a lithium battery explosion injured 30 people and killed 22. Modern societies will always need energy, and if we care about keeping people safe, nuclear really is one of the best options. The Three Mile Island accident in 1979 is an excellent example of this. When a partial meltdown occurred, the containment building functioned as designed, preventing any significant radiation release. The amount of radiation emitted was so minor that the maximum exposure for Pennsylvania locals would have been about the same as moving to Denver, Colorado. But how does simply moving to another city expose you to radiation? Every day of our lives, we're surrounded by naturally occurring background radiation, which varies from place to place and tends to increase at higher altitude. If you move from a sea level town to Denver, which is 1600 meters above sea level, the amount of cosmic radiation you're exposed to will increase. Radiation from a nuclear power plant is the same as natural radiation. Your body doesn't know the difference. It's important to realize radiation itself is not bad. Like most things in nature, it's only bad if you get too much of it. And the radiation you would get from simply living near a nuclear plant is minuscule. It would be about the same as flying from Sydney to Canberra once a year. But still, no one wants to risk building another Chernobyl in their backyard. But thankfully, modern reactors are built and operate very differently, which makes another nu nuclear explosion like Chernobyl virtually impossible. To understand why, let's explore three factors that were necessary for this disaster to happen. First, the reactor design allowed a positive feedback loop to cause a runaway chain reaction. As the nuclear material got hotter, the reaction sped up, making it even hotter. In modern reactors, the nuclear reaction slows down when it gets too hot, preventing this positive feedback loop from occurring. Second, the Chernobyl operators were Soviets. They ignored safety protocols to conduct a risky experiment outside the safe window when it could be conducted, because their superiors ordered them to. Modern reactors are run by operators trained to respond correctly to all possible scenarios. Strict protocols and regulations mean that modern reactors are much safer. The lessons from Chernobyl have not been wasted. Finally, the Chernobyl explosion only spread radioactive material because the reactor didn't have a strong containment structure. 
Modern reactors have an airtight containment structure made of steel reinforced concrete, more than a metre thick, strong enough to withstand even direct impact from a large aircraft. This means, in the profoundly unlikely event of a serious malfunction, radioactive material would be safely contained within the nuclear plant, keeping the environment and local communities safe. But what about the radioactive waste? Isn't it dangerous? Actually, waste from nuclear plants is a lot easier to deal with than waste from other energy sources. This is because nuclear fuel is extremely dense, which means it produces a tiny amount of waste compared to coal, gas, wind, or solar. In fact, the amount of nuclear waste produced from a lifetime's worth of electricity would be small enough to fit in a Coke can. The words nuclear waste probably bring to mind leaky barrels of toxic green goo. But nuclear waste actually looks like this. The nuclear waste emitting the most radiation is spent fuel, which is made up of solid rods. These rods are cooled on site in steel lined concrete pools for 7 to 10 years. Then they're transferred to metal canisters encased in concrete casks, known as dry cask storage. These casks are built to withstand extreme temperatures, earthquakes, cyclones, floods, and projectiles. Many countries recycle their used fuel to get an extra 25 to 30% more energy and reduce high level waste to one fifth of the volume. But even without recycling, the half life of nuclear fuel means the amount of radiation it emits rapidly declines. After 100 years, you could stand three meters from a used fuel bundle for four hours with no risk to your health. Nuclear waste becomes much, much safer over time. This is in stark contrast to waste from other energy sources. Solar panel waste contains cadmium and lead, which are known to cause cancer as well as neurological and cardiovascular problems. These elements don't degrade. They stay toxic forever. And because recycling solar panels is difficult and expensive, 90% end up in landfill. This is a big problem because solar energy produces a lot more waste per unit of energy compared to nuclear. By 2050, the United States solar panel waste is expected to reach 75 times as much as nuclear waste. But Australia doesn't have any nuclear plants, so how could we safely store the waste? Turns out Australia already has established practices for storing nuclear waste from our Lucas Heights research reactor. The Opal reactor has been operating since 2007, when it superseded HIFAR, Australia's first reactor, built in 1958. <laughs> At Lucas Heights near Sydney, the Atomic Energy Commission's building to house a second reactor is ready for the official opening by Prime Minister Menzies. These reactors have produced vital nuclear material used in diagnosing and treating cancer and other health conditions, helping to save the lives of many Australians. Used fuel rods are cooled on site, shipped overseas for recycling, then returned to interim storage in a secure facility only two kilometres from the Sydney suburb of Engadine. But what about long-term storage? Australia could follow Finland's example and build a geological repository deep in non-porous rock, which can safely store waste for the next 100,000 years. Or we could go down the recycling path to reduce the amount of waste in interim storage. And regardless of whether Australia includes nuclear energy in its energy mix or not, we will have to manage the waste from the AUKUS nuclear-powered submarine program. There are plenty of viable options in Australia just like there are in the 32 other countries that benefit from nuclear energy. If you'd like to find out more about Australia's energy landscape, head to energy.cis.org.au to read the frequently asked questions and other research from the energy team that I lead there. I'm Aidan Morrison for John Anderson Media. <laughs>